Come on, stop our hands and welcome everybody around the globe watching online. We love you, we love you, we love you. We're so grateful that you're tuning in and taking a little bit of time to spend with us this morning. Uh, God gave us two words for this church a long time ago. If you know them, shout them out with me, everybody. Come on. Hope and healing. Hope for you tomorrow and healing from your yesterday. Your yesterday. That's the best news you've heard all day is your yesterday ended last night. Yeah. Woo! He's preaching already, somebody. Like God really does want to give you purpose and life. And our job as a church, my wife and I, we have the great honor and privilege of pastoring Fellowship Church. We just want to help connect you to that purpose and to Jesus Christ. And so we're so thrilled that you're here. And uh, how exciting. The stuff that's happening right now is incredible that you're doing in the church. And uh, if you'd like to give today, we never tell people to give. We simply say pray. Do what God tells you to do. It takes the weirdness out of it. But there's a way that you could text it in or give online or there's a mailing address. There's even boxes on the back walls. And I want to tell you today, 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 you have planted three brand new churches in America. Come on, clap your hands. That's amazing. I think we're up to 950 churches that you have planted in America. And I'm going to show you the pictures of the pastors at the end of the day. But I'm so thrilled. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. You make all of this stuff possible. Now, we do have some things coming up. I like to give calendar items for those of you that like to know what's coming up. And follow us on social media, um, the church, myself, my wife. Make sure you don't stay in the dark on anything because we have so much going on. And sometimes, I, anybody have FOMO? Fear of missing out? Like, I have huge FOMO. As a matter of fact, my dog and me, I think we're the same personality type. We're both a seven on the Enneagram. And we hate missing out on stuff in life. And I don't want you to miss out on anything. So here's a couple things coming up. We have our small group semester that starts up again April the 11th. Now, listen to me. If you want to lead a small group, you got to let us know uh, today. So let us know. Go to our website. Say, I want to lead a small group, and we will help you find out what that looks like, a little interview process. And um, some people are like, man, I want to lead. I'm not sure what to lead. Just find something that you like to do and then do that. So uh, you can lead for almost any reason at all. And I always tell people, man, don't add another meeting to your life. I, we're meeting out. What are you already doing? Some people are working out. They're, they are, uh, I don't know, scrapbooking or playing basketball. Just turn around and make that a small group, and we'll, tell, we'll, we'll teach you how to take what you're already doing and turn it into ministry to help people during their life in different seasons, all right? Then we have Serve Day coming up, which we have March the 27th and April 3rd. We're going to do two in the next couple weeks. This is big, everybody. We're going to gather and, and, and donate and all this stuff and f go to our website and social media again to get the specifics but we're going to go to a couple hospitals and just love on the staff of these hospitals and tell them God loves you, no strings attached. How many think that's a good idea? And then our preview, sir, our preview day for our Fellowship Church Bible College is next weekend. Again, you just saw the video. And for some of you, God's tapping you on the shoulder to get enrolled in our Bible College. You're going to get all your questions answered at this and it's, it's accredited, it's fully accredited. We offer 57 different degrees that are fully transferable to any major college in America. It's a pretty big deal, guys. We have this college. You have a college right here at this church. And then, of course, we have eight Easter services coming up in two weekends from now. We start Friday night with two Good Friday services. Next week, by the way, is Palm Sunday. My wife is preaching. Don't miss that. And then Good Friday, we'll start Easter services with communion. And then two Saturday night. And then four Sunday morning. Guys, your best chance of getting a yes to a church invitation all year long is Christmas and Easter. So could you do me a favor and do your friends a favor? Just invite them. We'll do all the heavy lifting and we'll, we'll, we'll do the music and we'll do the message. I got a great illustrated sermon that I'm going to preach that day to make the gospel very relevant to everybody who comes in. But there are a couple seasons where you just need to have somebody who doesn't go to church sitting by you because they would, they would come if you just asked. What if we approached every person with that type of confidence? Like, I'm going to invite them. They're going to come, even if they don't. Like, some people are, like, how many have ever invited somebody to church and they didn't come the first time, but they came the second time or the fifth time or the 50th time? You, just ne you never know who's one more invitation away. So that's what's going on in the calendar, and then we're going to start a new series, Baptism, the weekend after Easter. I mean, just so much going on, 
And I'm so grateful to be, a, be a part of a church on the move. Amen, everybody. All right, grab your phones out for a second. Grab your phones out and take some notes. We used to hand out notes, BC, uh, that's before COVID. And um, we, we would hand out the notes and you'd take notes and write down notes and scripture and all that. We don't do that in this season, but you could take some because you will forget what I talk about. I promise you, it's, it, you'll forget. It's a very simple message, but I pray that it helps you today. And we're in a series called Relation Slips. Relation Slips. Here's why I entitled it that. Because every relationship has a tendency to slip. Every relationship has a tendency to go off track. And so part one, we talked about marriages. You can go back and watch any of these on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And like and subscribe that if you like. And then you know, part two, we talked about singles and dating. Woo! What do you do in that season? And then number three, part three, we talked about parenting and kids, that whole dynamic. And part four, last week, we, we talked about covenant relationships. What does that look like to have friends, the real type, good friends that can help you in your journey? And today I want to end with the most important one. It's the last sermon in the series, but it's the most important. It's your relationship with God. Okay, look at me, everybody. This one relationship affects all the other ones. Did you catch that? Like, like this, catch, this, this, this covers everything else and affects every other relationship. Here's our opening verse. Jesus said, seek first. Shout first. first. Come on, say first. first. Seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and... And like after that, and then all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first. Seek first. Seek first. first. Seek first. What's first mean? It means first. <laughs> like, like not second, you know? It means before anything else, put in first. Okay, watch this. Here's the problem. A lot of us want all the benefits that God offers us, but we want that without putting him first. In football, there's a saying called first and ten. Let's just call this first and then. You want all the benefits that God has, and he wants to give them to you. He's a, he's a generous God. But it doesn't happen until he is first. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done anything in the wrong order? Okay, uh, come on out here. This is Caleb. Give Caleb a hand, everybody. <laughs> Caleb, he's our model for today. Does anybody notice anything out of order in his wardrobe? Yeah. This, have you ever done that before? <laughs> you put on a shirt, and you didn't get that quite, that top button right? Okay, listen. Your relationship with God is a top button issue. If you don't get this right, it affects every other area of your life. So marriage, family, work, friends, none of that works right until God is first. Somebody say top button issue. Thank you, man. Top button issue. You got, now it looks great. If you, if you have your shirt and you start with the top button, if you get that right, it, everything else will fall in line. But the moment you, you forget or you get distracted and you get a little squirrely, let this be a reminder that your relationship with God is a top button issue. Okay, my first question was, have you ever done anything out of order? Here's my second question. Have you ever had something in order and then it got out of order? Like you were going to tell a joke. Uh, you know anybody like this, you're going to tell a joke and in your head it's in order and then you say the punchline. <laughs> You mess up the punchline, you say too soon. Like, you know those people, right? That, it, it was in order, got out of order. One time I was preaching, I was 20, no, I was, yeah, about 19, 20 years old. And I had 25 pages of notes. Oh, gosh, I wrote, I wrote it all out, all like on paper. Like, no, no iPad. Like, dead trees. I bring it, I come up, I'm nervous already. Come up to the pulpit, put my notes down. I welcome everybody, and they had, it was so hot in this church, and there was no air conditioning. They had a rotating fan. You know those type of fans? Well, I didn't know it, but that fan was stationed right here to keep me cool. What it did was it blew all my pages 
off of the pulpit onto the floor. You talk about panic. I'm about to preach. I'm 19. So many people, my pages go everywhere and I didn't number them. All right. So now I'm like, I look at everybody else. They look at me like, what are you going to do? The show must go on. Ladies and gentlemen, I pick up my paper. They're all out of order. And I, I put them back on and I start preaching. And what we, te- what we teach some of our Bible college students is like, if you ever get out of place in your notes, don't tell anybody because the people won't know. Like, don't tell people, don't, don't confess like, hey, I just really, well, I went out of order on my notes here. You know, just, let me go back for a second. They, they don't know. Well, guess what? Everybody knew that day. I started somewhere in the middle of the sermon, went to the conclusion, and then ended at the intro. Like, it was just all out of order. And my point is that things in order have a tendency to get out of order. Let me say it again. Things in order have a tendency to get out of order. So, write this down. Protect what's priority. Protect what's priority. You value what's priority. You protect what's priority. You fight for what's priority in your life. And, and here's a verse in Revelation. Okay, before I show you this, Jesus is talking to seven churches. He's writing and he says to one specific church, to the angel or to the leader of the church of Ephesus, I write, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You've persevered and have patience and you've labored for my namesake. You've done a lot of stuff for me and you've not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Okay, if God says he has something against you, you're going to want to listen. I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Okay, listen, everybody. He's talking about him. You used to love me, and you've left your first love. And then he gives us three steps. We're going to unpack this together. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Remember, repent do. Remember, repent, do. Now, as we unpack this, you need to know Jesus is not just talking to churches. He's talking to seven conditions of the soul. He says to this church and to us today, I remember when I was first in your life. I remember how you loved me, but, but that's not where we are right now. Life got busy, and this relationship has slipped. Okay, how many know it's never pretty when you slip? Think of a time you slipped in public. It was not pretty. What happens is we start off with God, and verse 2 and 3 encourages them. Guys, you've been doing great. You're working hard. Man, you haven't given up. You're enduring a lot of things for my name's sake. Way to go. You did a lot of great stuff right, but the biggest problem is you left your first love. And not just lost your first love, you left your first love. There's a difference between being lost and left. Okay, look at me, everybody. God's not lost. God did not move. We moved. Anytime we feel distant with God, it's not because he has moved. It's because we have moved. He's not lost. And so we look at this, and all the other stuff that they did didn't even really matter. At that moment, all that matters is is God first. You left your first love, and none of this other stuff really even matters at that moment because the most important thing is not in the most important place. Now, before we get too spiritual, start pointing fingers at people. You ever been in a church where you just felt like everybody's pointing fingers? The preacher's he's pointing fingers. Just you, 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 you. Okay, let me just tell you. I can relate to this. I know very well multiple times in my life where I have left my first love God. I'm not where I wasn't as close as I ought to be. And maybe some of you can relate to this today. I know we sit here and act like we got it all together, got our Sunday best on, and we don't want anybody to know. But I think there's a couple of us in the room that remember the time where you surrendered the controls of your life to Jesus. He forgave you, cleansed your past, gave you a new fresh start, hope, healing. And all I wanted to do was go to church. All I wanted to do was pray, read my Bible, tell people, about Jesus, sir, I couldn't serve him. They could not keep me away from the church. But over time, after a while of doing that, it's, it, 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 something begins to slip if you're not protecting what's priority. It's like the married couple 
who, when they were dating, they couldn't keep their hands off each other. They couldn't spend enough time with each other. Always texting, always calling. Be on the phone late at night, early morning. It's 1230 in the morning. Got the slow jams in the background. <laughs> You're not even talking, just breathing. <sighs> and one of them said, I got to get up early and go to work. Okay, we should hang up. All right, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. No, you hang, no, you hang up first. All right, we're going to hang up on the count three. <laughs> One, two, three. You still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm... <laughs> like when you were dating, oh, you could not be around that person enough. And then you get married. <laughs> and 10 years pass. And they call you and you answer, what? What you need? Why you call so much? And when she asks, guys, when she asks, hey, do you love me? I told you I loved you on our wedding day. If anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Come on, guys. Some of you used to be Mr. Casanova. Now you're just Mr. Sit on the sofa. Something needs to change. Get the fire back. Lost that loving feeling. Hmm. I'm talking to a group of people who knows what it feels like to bypass the honeymoon stage where over time you lose love and the passion and now things become mechanical and mundane. That same thing can happen in your relationship with Jesus where you lose the love and the passion that used to motivate and now it's mechanical, it's mundane, it's religion that's dead, it's ritual ritualistic and it lacks enthusiasm. We focus so much on the knowledge part. Like I just, yeah, I know God, I know, I, I'm going through the motions, but you don't love him like you used to love him and you don't love people the way you used to love people. Something has slipped. And Jesus was not talking to a bunch of couch potatoes here he said you guys are working you guys are serving you guys are doing a lot of great things but the big problem is you you've left your relationship with me now this has happened to all of us okay watch this watch this you, this is gonna make sense as we unfold it together when this happens when we leave or when our relationship with God slips out of place listen to me we feel religious but empty we don't feel right we feel religious but we're empty. It's like you're going through the motions externally, but on the inside, you feel distant from God. And on the outside, you might even look good. People might think you have it all together on the outside, but you're dying on the inside. This thing called Christianity is not just about how you look externally. Okay, when I go shopping, I always get angry when I buy a bag of chips. Because I buy the bag of chips, and it looks huge. It's a huge bag of chips. It grabs my attention. And I get home, and I open the bag of chips and realize, dang it, this thing is half empty. <laughs> it's full of a bunch of hot air. It's not as full as it portrayed itself to be. And I get home, and my selfish parenting style, I look at my girls when they were young, I'm like, here's one chip, share it with your sisters. <laughs> you know? <laughs> why do they package it this way? I'll tell you why. To attract attention. But it's a bunch of fluff. And then there's some people in life, you've met these people, where it seems like they have it all together, and it seems like they're so full of God and so full of purpose, and you're like, man, that's amazing. This is incredible. I look up to them, I watch them, but the more you watch them, the more you begin to realize <laughs> it was just a bunch of fluff. 
We're so busy trying to attract the attention of other people. We ought to be attracting the attention of God. He is the only opinion that matters. We don't want to be religious but empty on the inside where we don't have anything to offer people. We don't want to be religious and empty, and this is not about external circumstances and just looking well on the, good on the outside. God wants your heart. He wants relationship. Can I just tell you? He misses you. When Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, God didn't just come. What you do? Where you at? He missed that relationship. I'm trying to help you today. I want to add some value to you today. But if you're not careful, you go to this next part where you start feeling fake. I don't want to. I don't want to do that because I feel fake. And we start feeling justifiable in this emotion. Because, by the way, this is right where the devil wants you. He starts to whisper in your ear like, who do you think you are coming to church? Who do you think you are raising your hands in worship? Who do you think you are serving? And he gets you in a place, because remember, his goal is to ruin your relationship with God. And instead of running to God, we end up running away from God. And we feel justified. We even tell people. We almost take a pride in it. Like, I'm not going, I'm not going to church because, man, I ain't going to be fake. That's not me. That's not me. You know, I'm not fake, so I'm not going to go. You're playing into the devil's hands. I'm not going to be fake. Let me tell you what fake is. Fake is knowing about the grace of God and running away from it. I want to encourage somebody today. Don't you run away from God. Run towards God. Run to his love. Run to his grace. Run to his mercy. I'm telling you, that's keeping it real. If you're not careful, we start to feel religious and empty. We start to feel fake, and then we just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is detrimental to our walk because it's where I don't like how I feel, but I'm going to do nothing to change. And so we feel hopeless, empty, distant, and we, do, we don't do anything about it. This is where you lose your passion to, to go to church. This is where you lose your passion and, uh, to, and the sense of urgency to win people to Christ. And you're reaching for things that don't fill you up anymore and you start seeing only the negative and you start seeing people and things through a worldly view instead of God's view. You stop loving and serving people. You start to feel self-absorbed and self-focused and at the end, you end up bailing on Jesus, bailing on the mission, and bailing on your calling. Which, which, by the way, I don't know if you know this or not, but your heart bails long before your body does. And for some of you, your heart bailed a long time ago, you just keep showing up at church. Your heart bailed a long time ago, you just keep showing up at work. And he says, you have left your first love. If you're not careful... Now you feel religious but empty. You feel fake. You feel comfortable. And this is dangerous because then compromise starts to take place. You start slipping. Slipping. Time's not the only thing that keeps on slipping. We do if we don't protect the priority. And it's not that we, for, like we don't believe in God. It's that we temporarily forget him. We forget who he was and what he's done. And matter of fact, Paul says this way, there's people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They look good on the outside. Guys, listen to me. There is a power from God to live for him, to do what he's called you to do. There is a power many people are not accessing. They're, they're, they're going through the motions they have a form of godliness, but they're denying the power. I don't want you to deny the power that's available to you, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And Jesus goes on to even say, because in the last days, when wickedness keeps getting crazier and crazier, which I believe were there, the love of many will grow cold. What does that mean? Their love for their first love grows cold. 
They were once so on fire for God, but now it just feels mechanical, mundane, monotonous. And many people, they feel like it's one big leap. Like you're doing great, and then all of a sudden, it's one big, just one bad thing, and boom, you're gone. That's not how it happens. It happens. If you take enough itty-bitty steps in the wrong direction, you end up facing in the wrong direction. Are you getting this? For, for some people, they struggle with their walk with God in the low valleys. They do good on the mountaintop. Other people, they do good in the valley, they struggle at the mountaintop. The devil doesn't care which one it is for you. He's just trying to destroy your relationship with God. And I know that there is none of us in the room that want that. You ready for some good news? Come on, how many thank God our God is a God who saves and restores. He's a God who rebuilds and recovers. He gives hope and healing. And by the way, if your walk with God can grow cold, guess what? It can also grow hot. You can turn the element back up again. So what do we do? I told you what we do. Jesus told us what. He never corrects us without giving us instruction. Aren't you glad about that? He's not expecting you to just find the way by yourself. He gives us the three points, and I'll unpack them from the first verse. He says, number one, remember. Remember. Just remember. Remember what? Remember his grace. Remember his love. Remember how Jesus made you a priority. John 3, 16, which I'm going to talk about on Easter Sunday morning, and you need to bring your friends to church. I'm telling you, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you're not careful, it's so easy to go through the motions and you lose your gratefulness and awe of who God is. And your relationship starts to slip because familiarity breeds contempt. You're around it so much, and at one point you were just so thrilled that God would pick you. And after a while, if you don't guard it, there's a tendency for that relationship to slip, and you start to think, ah, it's just the cross. It's just another sermon. It's just another Sunday. It's just another small group. Why do I have to go to church? So I don't think I even need to show up. We start to remember or forget what we're supposed to remember, and we remember what we're supposed to forget. And if we forget, listen, it, many of us have forgotten not only how much God loves us, but we forgot if it had not been for the Lord, we would have lost our minds. Is there anybody in the room today or watching online that can testify a little bit that if it had not been for God, we would have sunk in despair. We would have been overwhelmed with depression. And if the truth be known, there are some of y'all that wouldn't even be alive to be sitting next to the people you're sitting by right now. Somebody shout, I can't forget. We need to remember the grace of God and how easy it is for us to forget. And by the way, we did not get here by our own. We did not get here by ourselves. It was God who brought us from darkness to light. He brought us from death to life. And now we can never forget the grace of God because it is not he that owes me. It is me that owes him everything. Come on, turn and tell somebody I can't forget. Turn and tell somebody else I can't forget. I can't forget. Don't forget who he is. Don't forget how he's loved you and has loved you to the depths. In your worst season, he still loved you. Hmm. Anybody grow up in church? Remember this old, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Oh, Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, no. Some of y'all clapping on the wrong beat. It's okay. All the white people, it's, it's the other one. 
I love this church. All right, look. You have to occasionally remind yourself of the goodness of God. You got to speak to yourself. Look in the mirror and remind yourself of what God has done for you. Remind yourself of the value that he has placed on you. Because if, if, if you're not careful, you forget. So remember. Number, number two, he told us to repent. Now, if you've grown up in church, some of you are like, Whoo, you put a wall. As soon as you saw repent, you're like, oh, that's a, that's a mean word, Sean. You might have had a pastor waving his finger in your face, telling you, you repent, you, you just repent. You, 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 just me, just bleh. Okay, this is not a bad word. It's a great word. You know what it means? It's not scary at all. It means you were going your way and you turned around. That's what repent. Don't you hate it when you make a wrong turn? You're in a city you're not familiar with. You get to an intersection that has that stupid sign. No U-turn. Heaven doesn't have that sign. Wherever you are, in any intersection, in your, I don't care what, where, what street you're on, I don't care what bar you're sitting in, I don't care what wrong relationship, you could have a needle in your arm right now. You have a God who allows you turns at any moment Oh, I wish I had a couple people in this room today that's grateful God allowed you to turn around. Woo! There's something that happens when you repent, when you turn around. You realize, oh, God, thank you for even making this possible at this intersection. Here's a verse. Repent then and turn to God. It tells us what to do, and it tells us the definition. And then says, here's the benefit. Your sins may be wiped out. Like, like that's enough. And God is such a gracious God, filled with surprises. He's like, but wait, there's more. Like if you call right now, I'll throw this in for free. Then there'll be times of refreshing that come from the Lord. When we, when we leave our first love, we start to feel religious and empty, bankrupt spiritually. We feel fake, and we start to feel comfortable at being uncomfortable. And God comes along and says, listen, if you just turn to me, there will be a season of refreshing that will flood your soul. There's joy, grace, mercy, peace. But seek first his kingdom. This is a top button issue. Come on, clap your hands if you're thankful for the word of God. So when we left our first love, whenever we've left it, remember his grace, run back to him, repent, and then decide what you're going to do. Like, what are you going to do now? Just because you decide something in your mind, if you don't actually put it on the calendar, it's not going to be done. How many of y'all have said over the last year of the pandemic, I'm going to start working out. As soon as those gyms open, <laughs> nope. nope, nope, I'm gonna start eating healthy. Nope. <laughs> a dream without a plan is just a wish. Somebody said. I remember I was playing basketball. Played a lot of basketball growing up, <clears throat> and we were we were pretty good. <sighs> so we were a little cocky. You know, we'd show up to a park, and there'd be a bunch of other dudes playing basketball. we just roll up like, you know, you walk a little different on the court. <laughs> we got next. This one dude one day was talking smack on the court. I looked at him, I was like, 
But don't just talk about it. Be about it. Everybody say that with me. Come on, online and in person. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. Say it one more time with attitude and then drop the head the second, on the second part. You ready? Ready? <laughs> ready? I love you guys. Ready? Don't just talk about it. Be about it. Well, he was about it because he won. Yeah. What was I trying to say to him? I was trying to communicate that your talk is worth nothing unless there's some action. So you get inspired at a church service. If you do nothing, then guess what? Nothing happens. And by the way, can I also say this? Don't do half the work unless you're, unless you're satisfied with half the results. So what are you going to do specifically because God wants to be first. He tells us what to do. He said, go back and do what you did at first. Do you remember when you were so taken with Jesus where he saved you, forgave you, and you had that moment of, thank you, God. He says, don't just go back and do what you did but how you did it. Don't just serve people. Serve people with the heart of Christ. Don't just worship God. Do it with enormous gratitude because grace is free, but faith without works is dead. Make a decision. So what, what are some things that help foster a healthy relationship? I think you ought to pay high attention to and give priority to a few things. I write these down, not on your notes, but just number one, worship. Like worship him. Okay, what is worship? It's showing worth to him. It's telling him how, how much you love him. You're pouring your affection on God. And by the way, we're a worshiping church. I said we're a worshiping church. When we come in, don't ever make the band crank you into worship. Come on, everybody, lift your hands. Come on, everybody, let's worship. Come on, can you sing? Can you just stand? Can you do something? <laughs> we don't come to watch a band. We don't sing karaoke. We come in and we worship. We lift our hands as a sign of surrenderance to God for who he is. We sing out. I don't care if you even sing off key. We worship God. And we don't have a way. Like some people are like, this is how I worship. <laughs> we don't have a way. God told us what worship looks like in the Bible. So there is no my way. It's only his way. It's not about us being comfortable. It's about him being worthy. It's about lifting our hands, lifting our voice, and spending time in worship. I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning to spend 45 minutes in just worship. God, I love you. You're amazing. You're fantastic. Your grace, ah, oh, I don't even know what to do with it today. There's more mercy than I can even use up today. Worship. Look at me. Look at me. Do it every day. And then give attention and priority to prayer. What's that? Talk to God. I don't know how to tell him what to say. If you could talk, you could pray. Performance anxiety, let that go out the window trying to sound like somebody else. Just talk. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Do it every day. Read your Bible. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Every day. There are too many leaders in this season who are not reading the Bible. And they're leading out of a worldly mentality instead of a biblical mentality. We have a biblical worldview, not a worldly worldview. But you don't know what to offer people if you're not reading the Bible. A lot of people are like, I don't know where to start. I'll give you a great place to start. You ready for this? On the inside. Just start. It's God's word. People died went to their death, were martyred recording the scriptures and then translating it for accuracy, beheaded and burned at the stake. And then when's the last time we even honor the word of God? Just, I got to get, well, how long do I read? Until something moves you. 
And by the way, when you get to a list of names, as your pastor, I give you permission to skip it. All right, just... And then Havishai gave birth to Methuselah, Methuselah, Habunadu, Benadab, and Joash, and what is it? Is this devotional time? I can't even pronounce those things. But how rich. It's crazy. You'll read the Bible. It doesn't matter when you start or where you start. You'll find God happens to have you read the right passage at the right time for the right direction. Seek first, and then all these other things are added unto you. Everybody, 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 get in a small group. Everybody. Look at me. Look, look, look. Everybody. If, you, if I'm your pastor, if Diane and I are your pastor, if we're your pastor, this is how we pastor you. Get in our sm small groups. Get in the growth track. What's the growth track? Three classes. It'll help you join the church, which, by the way, clap your hands for 61 people joining the church this month. <laughs> Second week, we help you discover your gifts. Third week, man, get in a small group or get on the team. It's simple. Your next opportunity is Easter Sunday morning. I can't think of a better day to go through growth track and to say to Jesus, I'm committed to building your church because it's the only thing you built on planet Earth than on Resurrection Sunday. We're expecting those classes to be full every service online, 10 o'clock. All right, you got me? You got me? Don't just talk about it. We're waiting for the next big thing to all of a sudden make us super close to God. And we forget it's the everyday little stuff that builds relationship. Do not tell me that you believe in God and don't give him time. Be intentional. And all this devotion, prayer, Bible study, serving people, it will not make God love you more, but it will make you love him more. He already loves you to the max, but it causes your heart to come alive, come alive, and all the dead places in your life open up again to him. Give attention and time to this and decide a place for this time. If it's important, put it on the calendar. Like date night. Diane and I used to not have a date night first year of marriage. We just kind of fit it in where, where we could fit it in. How many know if you do that, it ain't gonna happen? So now Wednesdays, Date night. It's date night. Matter of fact, last Wednesday, we had two dates. How many know that was a good day in the Nepset house? <laughs> we had breakfast date and dinner date. Same day. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. But we guard it. People want to do something on Wednesday? Oh, that's a date night. You guard what's priority. And what you're doing is you're investing in it. Any relationship takes investment. God has already invested his son. Come on. He died for us on a cross and rose to free us from sin. That's a pretty hefty investment. He would like to see a return on that investment, which is our life now given to him. And any relationship takes energy, money, planning. It's amazing how much like, you know, some people are like, I just don't have time. Okay, well, I don't know if that's true. Because we're all busy. The world's ran by busy people. So um, I always think it's funny, though, like for a guy, he's like, I ain't got time for his girlfriend. Just, oh, I just man, I'm just so busy. And then she threatens to leave, and all of a sudden he has all this time. Yeah. Wow. Where's the time? He just invented time. <laughs> Take this hand, everybody. Take one hand up. This represents your values. This hand, go like this. Jazz hands. This represents your actions. Okay, put them together. They ought to line up. Oftentimes, they don't. So what we're doing in this relation slip series is realigning. Because God's first. You say, God's first. Really? Show me. Just because you say something's a priority doesn't mean it's a priority. Just because you have a gym membership doesn't mean it's working. Hey, show your friend your calendar and your bank account. They will tell you what's priority to you. 
what you spend your time on, what you spend your money on, they'll tell you. And by the way, in everything you do, what's everything mean? You guys are smart. In everything you do, what? Put God first. In one area? No. In, in everything. In everything. When people stop tithing, I can recognize the relationship with God is slipping because he's no longer first. When people stop reading the Bible, I can tell that the relationship with God is slipping because he's no longer first. Fill in the blank. In any area where God's not first, that relationship is slipping. And when God is first, my spouse gets a better me. When God's first, my spouse gets a better me and my kids get a better me. When my spouse is first and God's first and my spouse is second and my kids, then you get a better me. Are you seeing how this is a top button issue? If, if, the, if you don't get the top button right, every other area... If God's not first, your marriage is affected, your kids are affected, your job's affected, your friendships are affected. This has got to be priority number one. Make him first. And then, if that's, if that's us, recognize what's hindering. So what's getting in the way? Okay, we all have stuff, me included. We all do. And in the Old Testament, by the way, God says and establishes a principle. You shall have no other gods before me. Most of the Old Testament, the judgment of God came on the people because of idolatry. They were worshiping foreign gods or worshiping the stars or worshiping a moon or a rock or an idol. And judgment came because God's very clear. Don't worship any other gods before me and worship the right way. So we don't worship him through stuff. Like I don't, we don't worship, Lord, I'm going to worship you through the pulpit. Worship you through the pulpit. And some of you are like, Sean, could you just... Like, pass through this one real quick because none of us are, you know, we're not bowing down to statues. Okay, idols are statues, but idols go much deeper than that. Idolatry or an idol is anything that gets between you and God. So what is the hindrance in your life? We all have a list, and all I'm asking you to do today is reorder the list. For some of you, God might be on the list, but he's just not first. And if he's not first, we got a problem. So reorder the list. Here's why, okay? Colossians, Paul says, and he, is it okay I'm teaching you today? And he, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He died, rose for us, that in all things he may have preeminence. What's that word mean? First. He is supreme. He is superior. Above him, there is no other. He is in a class all by himself. There's not even a close second. He is all that we need, and we need all that he is. He deserves to be first, and guess what? He only fits in first place. He's too big to fit in second. He's too big to fit in fourth place. He fits in first place. And if he's been moved to the back burner for any of you, let me just tell you, reorder the list. My friends are going to come out here, everybody. I have a little illustration. Hopefully, you'll never forget this. Okay, they all have a letter as they come up today. They're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with this phrase. And let's cram together. Come over, come over, come over, come over. Okay, um... Tisvoid Sirg. Tisvoid Sirg. Doesn't make any sense because it's out of order. But if I start moving things around and I start moving you down here and you over here and you down here, it takes some time to start reordering the list. But, but, but. If you're not careful, oh, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You're like, Sean, you messed up on the illustration. Oh, you're telling me that if just one is out of place, it still doesn't make sense. If every area is out of place, 
life doesn't make sense. I would venture to say there's a few of us in the room that are doing pretty good with most every area, but we got that one area that's out of order, which affects the rest. It's not going to be clear until God is, uh, your life will never make sense until God's first. So reorder the list. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Almost done. Is this helping? Yes or no? Here's four, four questions, all right? On the list, when you think about a list, what needs to be pushed out? It's on, it just it doesn't even be on the list at all. What needs to be brought on the list? What is too high on the list and needs to be pushed down? Second, third, fourth, and then what needs to be brought up? Just ask yourself, do this exercise, and once you have this, out, on, up, down, up. Sounds like a Contra code from Nintendo. <laughs> out, on, down, up. Out, 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 on, down, up. And then once it's in the right order, guys, protect the order at all costs. Because Jesus says, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then all these other things, like pieces of a puzzle, they start to fall in place. Don't seek the things first. Seek him first. Get that relationship healthy again. And Jesus replied, we've said this a lot around here. And somebody said, what's the greatest commandment? Oh, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The first, and this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. God knows how much you love him by how you treat people. So it's, he didn't say it's gold and silver metal. It, they're both gold. The guy asked for one. He gave him two because you can't divorce these two. Love God. Love people. His church. And I end with this thought. Do you remember the moment when you were so taken with Jesus? Again, where you would have done anything for him. Has Jesus changed? Have, have the needs of people changed? Or have you changed? And in the quietness and the holiness of this moment, I would ask you to tell the Lord, I'm reordering the list. I'm putting you first again. I don't want this relationship to slip any longer. I remember your grace. I turn around and I'm gonna do everything I can to protect the order. He's first. It is a top button issue. Would you bow your heads with me? Watching online here in this room, I want to give you an opportunity to pray a commitment prayer. I have often had the relationship with God slip, sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot. It's perfectly normal, but it's, you don't want to stay there. Come running back to God, Remember His grace. He will forgive and cleanse you and a time of refreshing will come from the Lord. But I'm going to ask you in just a second to raise your hand if you need to reorder the list. If God's not there at the top of the list online, here in the service, if this is you, say, Sean, count me in that prayer. I'm reordering the list. God's not first, but I'm going to make Him first today. I'm coming back to my first love. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand up and just leave it up. One, two, three. Lift it up and leave it up. I'm going to count them all. Lift them up. Lift them up high. Lift. Yes, yes, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifty, six, seven, eight, nine, twenty. One, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, eight, nine, thirty, thirty, one, thirty, two, thirty, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, forty, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, fifty, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, six, 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 one, six, two, six, three, four, six, five, six, six, seven, six, eight, six, nine, seven, six, seven, one, six, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eighty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ninety. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a hundred. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventeen, eighty. 118 people in this service alone saying, God, I'm coming back to my first love. I'm remembering your grace. I'm turning around. I'm recommitting to you again. I know there's many watching online making the same decision. 
You say, Sean, why are you counting? It's not about the numbers. Let me be very, very clear. It is all about the numbers because every number represents a soul. And every soul has a name and a story that Jesus came and died for so you can have relation. He just wants relationship. The entire Bible could be summed up in that one word, relationship. So if that relationship has slipped, and you didn't raise your hand, but you needed to, I'm going to give you one more time. Just slip it up right now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I see. Great, great, great. We'll pray these words out with you. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me first. Today I choose to remember your love and grace. Thank you for allowing me to turn around. Today I give my life to you. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean. Let a season of refreshing come to my life. And I commit to putting you first and to serving people as unto you. Now in the quietness of this moment, just ask him. He's already highlighting, what do I do? What's my next step? He's talking to you right now. Schedule time in the Word, the Bible. Pray. Schedule. When are you going to do it? Make up in your mind. Get in the growth track Easter Sunday morning. Lead a small group. Get in our college. What's he asking you to do? Just make the steps really clear in your mind and then guard that. If it's priority, put it on the calendar. God, I'm so thankful that even when we have slipped in our relationship, you're filled with grace and mercy, and you call us back on mission again. I bless my friends now in the name of Jesus Christ. May they go with a new found excitement in their relationship to go back and remember how it felt at first in the relationship with you. I love you, Jesus. Amen.